My name is Amasi. My pronouns are they, them, and theirs. And I was at BYU from 2011 to 2012. I was there for three semesters. At first, I was studying theater. I was studying uh, playwriting and a little bit of acting. I was in a main stage pr uh, production at BYU. And then my second year, I was accepted into the media music program, which was new at that point. I don't know if it's around anymore. It was only six people who got accepted. So it was fairly competitive. Um, and it was a program that was based on uh, music production, the business of music, um, writing music, kind of the behind the scenes. And um, it was kind of a little more face focused on, on writing church music at the point. <laughs> so um, it's kind of a good thing that I didn't finish my time at BYU. Um, I left after my third semester for some dubious reasons. I, I guess we'll probably talk a little bit more about those. Well, when I first went, um, I mean, BYU is like the, it's the school to go to. Um, if you're if you're from Utah Valley, I mean, I was raised in Lehigh. Essentially, uh, because I didn't do research on outside schools, my, my parents were kind of pressuring me. It's either um, BYU or University of Utah if, I, if you don't make it into BYU. I also got a, free, a full ride scholarship to BYU. And so it made a lot of sense to me. And um and it's got lots of really awesome programs. Um, it's a really cultured place. I mean, it's got lots of languages because of the way that mission culture has brought the world together. Uh, there are a lot of things going for the school. My first year at BYU, I was at Heritage Halls, which uh, is an environment in which you're you're interacting with your ward a lot, right? Uh, the people all around you are going to the church with you, and sometimes they have classes with you, so it's a really tight-knit community. Um, and I got pretty close with my bishop, and then after my first year, after I realized that I was gay, then I started to date somebody. And when I came back in the fall, I continued to talk to my bishop, um, since I considered him a confidant and a friend. And at some point he said that I should probably leave uh, because he insinuated that he was going to talk to the honor code office. And um, I wanted to avoid all of that myself. I was already pretty vulnerable. My life was changing a lot. So um, I decided to leave. Uh, I wasn't asked to leave, but um, it feels like it was kind of the same thing. When I was first attending BYU, uh, I think for the first month or two, there was this great high being there. Like everyone around me believes the same thing I do. Um, I got into the school that I wanted to go to, you know, like I'm here, I'm making new friends. Um, I'm not that person that I was in high school anymore. I'm not limited. Um, and then I started to feel these pressures around me, um, and I started to feel that I wasn't being authentic myself. Um, I was being pressured in a lot of ways to date girls. I was being pressured to socialize more in a masculine way. I was being pressured to um, choose my major, go for it, go all in, and, and um, try and live the dream, try and get it all, you know. And uh, when I came out, everything kind of broke into a million tiny pieces. I remember um, I I got on my knees and prayed for a really long time, as one does, and asked, is it okay that I have a crush on this guy that I really like? And the answer was yes. And it was like a spiritual answer for me, where I'd received those kinds of answers for questions before. And so that was super confusing for me. <laughs> like, what does this mean? Everyone says this is not okay. Um, and yet I'm feeling the tingles, like I'm feeling everything telling me that, that this is right for me. Not that just that it's okay, but it's, it's what I should be doing. Considering that I was praying about a particular boy, I mean, I was asking for permission to be gay in general, but, um, it was because I had a crush on this person. So considering that I got that such a strong answer in response to this prayer about a boy, it's, um, kind of disappointing that he didn't end up being, like, <laughs> the person I spend my life with. Um, it actually only, my crush only lasted like another week, but um, it was a it was a big, big experience for me to just receive that big of an answer, to kind of open me up to the possibility that maybe, um, maybe these uh, characters that I'd been told about my whole life, um, God, Jesus Christ, angels, um, bishops and leaders, um, maybe they weren't exactly what I had thought that they were. Um, and I think I dove pretty quickly into atheism and cynicism. And that was a, for me, that was like the rubber band snapping and I just shot off the other way. You know, I was, um, I was just so cynical about everything and I started to learn all of the anti-Mormon literature and I started to, to talk about it with my friends who were also kind of waking up a little bit to, um, 
to the fact that the world was larger than our little Utah Valley that we grew up in. There were some moments where, uh, I think that's where I really started to feel my depression. Um, anxiety is also a problem for me these days, but depression is the one that, um, that was, that's my original, you know, that's my friend since childhood. <laughs> um, I think there were a few times where I would just go on a walk around campus and then uh, kind of get lost and then find myself in two or three hours and realize I've been walking around for a long time just like feeling nothing, feeling sad for myself, feeling like I can't talk to these people who I pass by, feeling disconnected from everything, feeling like I don't belong here. It was near the end of my first year when I was starting to realize like there's not a place for me here in a way where I can, um, where I can speak my authentic self. After I left BYU, I wasn't able to go to another school. Um, I moved back in with my parents, but it was kind of difficult at home. Um, and so I felt, I, I didn't feel safe there, so I, um, I moved out on my own. And uh, of course, when you move on your own, you have bills, you have rent. So uh, I got a job to support myself, and then it was just, it was kind of a rough time for me. Um, I got into debt a little bit to keep myself afloat, as one does, and then um, I've gone from job to job ever since then till now I haven't been able to return to school. Well, it was bubbling up for a long time, <laughs> for my whole life. I mean, you know how it goes, like other kids around you are talking about the girls that they like or um, they're talking about uh, more and more what it means to be a young man or to be, in, to be, be becoming an adult man. Um, and I just never really found authentic ways to engage in those conversations and spaces and to socialize myself. And then my roommate, my first year at BYU was gay. And um, that whole year I'd kind of flirted with going to uh, USGA, the Understanding Same Gender Attraction Club. And I'd kind of started to learn a little bit more about what it means to be a gay person. I didn't really know what a gay person was. That's kind of how sheltered I was. Um, I didn't know that people, um, that people dated and, and had sex for fun and um, that they expressed themselves that way. Um, I think that was the year of It Gets Better. And uh, so that, that came right around Christmas time uh, between my semesters when I was really, I had started to go to USGA and I knew that people out there were gay and I was thinking maybe this is me. Um, my roommate came to me near the end of the year and said, I have to leave BYU. Um, I guess you probably owe it. I, I owe you an explanation. And I said, yeah, I'd like for you to tell me. And then he told me he was gay and it just, it, it burst open. I'd never really been able to talk about it before. I'd never really been able to think about it before. Before that point, even though I was going to the USGA club and I was, I was watching these videos and reading online about what it means to be a gay person, it was all still really subconscious for me. It was, it was really weird. I couldn't have talked about it unless somebody had given me the words. Um, and he kind of, he gave me the words by saying it himself. And then right then I was able to say it out loud and, and I knew that it was true. Coming out I thought would be like a single moment where you say, I'm gay, here I am everybody, and then it's over. What I found was that, um, that that first night when I came out, when my roommate came out to me and then I was able to then come out back to him, I kind of thought like this is the, the after moment, like everything has changed and now I will become so much more authentic and all of my problems will just fall into place and I'll have all the solutions. It was a, a few months later that um, that my family found out, but they kind of dragged me out of the closet a little bit. Um, it's actually kind of a terrible story. We were at a family party and my parents pulled me to their bedroom and read conference talks at me and then asked me if I had same gender attraction. And I said, yes. Um, and they said, that's okay, we're here to help you through. Uh, we'll help you work with this and then um, they suggested that I should probably try and make a relationship with one of my friends who I'd met at BYU the first year and see if I could you know, ask her if she would marry me. I mean, at first I said, I don't think that I need to be fixed, but um, I had also only had one conversation about being gay. And that was with this person who was my roommate. Um, I didn't really have a support group. I didn't really have words or, or literature that I'd read. Um, so I kind of couldn't defend myself, I guess you could say. I, I had started to date somebody. He was kicked out by his family for having come out as well. He was racist and Mormon as well. So we were kind of in the same boat. Um, we got pretty tight pretty quick. 
we actually at some point decided that we didn't work as a couple, but that we wanted to be friends. And then we were roommates for like three years after that, which was crazy. Like uh, there was a lot of work to go from being boyfriends to being roommates. But um, he and I didn't really have anyone else. And I think that's a pretty common experience in coming out. Like you lose some friends, you lose some family. And whoever you've got left, um, even if it's not an ideal situation, uh, they're your support and you just don't want to be alone. Around that time, um, my friends from high school and from college um, were, I, I had started to have conversations one-on-one -on -one with them um, to kind of, you know, break the news softly. And um, it's, a, it's a little hard for me to talk about still. I'm still kind of not over it. Um, a lot of my friends uh, got together and had these, uh, they had regular conversations about how to help me get back on the right path. Um, and and I didn't know that this was happening. I'd, I'd hang out with them on Wednesday and then they'd get together on a Saturday and, you know, talk about how to help me. I'm sure that they did other things. <laughs> I don't think it was a powwow just to like help me, but this was happening and I had no idea until one of my friends came to me and said um, that he didn't feel right about it and that I should know. Um, so I, f I feel like, I don't know, my family group fell apart pretty quickly. My friend group fell apart pretty quickly. And um, all I had was just this guy that I was dating. Um, so it was pretty rough, to be honest with you. I would say that my, my journey's been, uh, the tone of it has been spiritual more than anything else. Um, I think the moment that I actually detached from Mormonism was when um, I realized that this religion said that um, Hindus and Jews and uh, Buddhists and uh, Muslims couldn't come to heaven with us. And I thought, I'm learning about these religions, they seem really cool, and I've met some people who believe these things. And I don't want to live in a world where these people can't come to heaven with me. That was kind of a soft realization. It wasn't like a super angry like outburst. I just in, in one moment realized like, oh, I, I'm not thinking in this way that I was raised to think anymore. And then from there, I just decided to search around and see what there was. <laughs> I smoked weed for the first time. Um, I tried acid for the first time. Um, I met lots of people who were a little bit edgy because when you leave your uh, your faith that you're raised in, then suddenly um, you don't have a system for what's right or wrong yet. So I was meeting lots and lots of different kinds of people and hearing lots and lots of different kinds of stories and um, realizing that there were a lot of possibilities out there and I had no idea which one is right for me. I think over time, it's been a, a slow burn realization that there is a deep connection between me and all of this stuff that's all around us, this thing that I call creation or the cosmos at some point. That has always stayed with me. It's kind of like been a pilot light and it's been actually what's kept me from, um, from losing my life, from losing my hope, from losing my connection to my own fundamental humanity, my own, my own personal sanity. My family I am actually living with right now, which I never thought would be possible. I always thought we were going to be fighting. I always thought there was going to be a problem. I never thought that they would be that they would be okay with me being gay. Not that I need anybody to be okay with me being gay. That's something that I've decided on and that's something I've decided to uh, to hold my own strength there. It's been a process of um, of holding my ground and of letting them know in every situation that this is who I am and never letting them take any ground from me. Um, I've had to be a little bit defensive, to be honest with you. Because at first they'd say things like, are you still reading your scriptures? Are you still going to church? Have you met any girls? And I'd have to say every time, mom, I don't go to church anymore. Dad, sorry, I don't read the scriptures. I don't believe these things anymore. Um, I'm gay, I don't date girls. I'm dating a guy though. Um, and that was really, really hard for them. I mean, they'd never been through it before. I have a lot of sympathy for them because um, I've been through a lot of strange and hard things and and that's different for everybody. What, what's strange and hard is uh, so specific to you, what you've been through. So at some point I learned that it, it wasn't serving me to be angry with my family all the time. Uh, it actually served me to be a little more patient with them and just learn how to take deep breaths. So um, I think they slowly started to get used to that. But I had moved to Portland in 2016 and I met this guy that I really, really liked. And we had dated for several months and then he asked me to marry him. And I said yes. And um, 
I decided that I needed to, uh, that was a moment that I needed to talk to my family and in a way, make sure that they accepted this as a part of my life because I didn't want to have this conflict every single time it came up. Um, so I called them, I talked to them, um, they talked to this guy that I was dating and I was actually really surprised by, um, by the chance that they took. I knew that it was uncomfortable for them. I knew that they maybe had different plans for me when I was growing up, but uh, they had conversations with this guy that was my fiance. I don't know, we didn't have an argument, I guess you could say. And that was a big marker of, of progress. My relationship with that guy didn't work out. It's really just taken me holding my ground and knowing who I am um, in situation after situation and communicating to them, like, I don't want to lose your con my connection with you. I, I don't want to lose my place in this family. I want to be a part of this group. And it hurts me that you want to disconnect from me because I am trying to be my most authentic self. If you care about me, I would like for you to accept this part of me that I didn't choose. So, I mean, at this point, uh, it, it, it's not something we really talk about all that much, but we've had the conversations and I think the the biggest thing that changed everything was time. I am non-binary which uh, I didn't really realize um, until maybe about two years ago so in a lot of ways I'm still forming my language around it. My whole life I, I've always felt different than other boys and, and when I came out as gay um, I thought like oh this was it <laughs> this is why I felt so different and in the years since I've realized a lot of my gay male contemporaries have gone on and socialized as men. Like, they present masculine, they get into parts of male culture, I mean, they interact with women in particular ways, like, e even as gay men. Gay men interact with women different than, than straight men do, but even still, there seems to be kind of a song and dance um, that is more or less common across a lot of different experiences that I've seen. And it just doesn't feel like it speaks to my experience. Growing up as a Mormon, um, and especially going to BYU, there are really, really rigid gender roles. Especially in terms of when you get to the dating world, uh, how men and women interact with each other, and how that puts you in your place um, as you join the community and become who you will be for the rest of your life. When you leave the Mormon church, when you're an LD, ex-LDS person, uh, there's kind of this moment where everything rearranges, where you become a new person, um, where the old you dies in a lot of ways. And you have, to, uh, you have to acclimatize to the way that things are now. You have to learn how to do so many things. You have to learn how to drink a beer <laughs> or how not to drink a beer if that's not for you. You know, you, you don't know at that point um, you haven't had the experience yet to say, like, I am a beer drinker or I'm not a beer drinker. You don't know so many things like, um, what do I say when somebody offers me drugs? I mean, you know from elementary school to say no, but then it actually happens to you when you're at a bar in downtown Salt Lake City and you think, like, I'm not prepared for this situation. I, I feel like I should say no. But the point is that you just don't have the experience. It, it has a lot of similarities with being genderqueer. I know that as an adult coming to my genderqueer identity, there were a lot of things that I had to learn how to do resting in this new identity. I mean, there were a lot of times before where I'd walked into the clothes store and, um, and what side do I go to? I go to the men's side. Now on the other side of this, uh, of this coming out as non-binary, um, there are so many options open to me. Through all these changes, <laughs> there were so few things that were constant. So many things were changing day to day. Um, I mean, I, I gotta be honest with you, sometimes I go out of the house and I'm, I'm presenting a little bit more feminine because I decided, you know, I'm gonna wear a shawl today or I'm gonna paint my nails or I'm gonna put on a little bit of eyeliner. And then the first person I talk to, I think, well, shit, like that was the wrong choice for me today. Through all of that, the only thing that stays constant to me is that I am a person who is alive. I deserve to be here because I was born and I deserve to take up the space because I still breathe. And it's more important for me to say that out loud and for me to go everywhere I go and to take up that space because if I don't, then um, I'm, I'm not honoring that connection that I have with myself. Um, it's something that I have to discover every single day. I think that's, I think that's true for everybody, but especially for gender queer people. It can be really, really tough. You walk into a space and from all directions, 
People are asking you questions with their eyes. They're, they're saying, why did you choose to wear this? They're saying that they don't agree with something that you're doing. Or on the flip side, they're, you know, they're trying to shower you with accolades or they're trying to relate to you because they think what you're wearing is cool. All of it's embarrassing. <laughs> All of it is super embarrassing because um, you're still gaining that experience. Like I didn't get to try on eyeliner in eighth grade with all of the other girls and like get it wrong and come to school and have that be okay. Like I'm, I'm doing that as a 27 year old person. Spend some time with yourself every single day. Spend some time just with yourself and let your thoughts happen and just take deep breaths, write in your journal. I mean, that may sound like cheesy advice, but I think it's really, really important when I think back to the times when I felt the most stressed, I didn't have any time for myself. And even when I got alone, um, there were racing thoughts, or I had to distract myself, or I had to run away somewhere, or I had to get involved in something. There's something inside of us that already knows what is right for us. And if you're not able to live in authenticity, then that voice, uh, it won't be quiet. So take a minute just with yourself and just listen. There's this actually a, a verse from the Bible that returns to me quite often. It's the part that says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. And I think of that a lot because as you go on this journey to express your most authentic self, you're going to walk through that valley of the shadow of death and you're going to go through a dark night of the soul. Something about it just gives me comfort. I don't know. That's all I can say.